today we're gonna talk about what this the born again experience is what does it mean to be born again you know and a great scripture to to read is john 3 from verse 1 to 13 so we'll read there was a man of the pharisees named nicodemus a ruler of the jews this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? You know, I, I was really having a hard time when, <laughs> when he said this. Because I, I started picturing myself going back into my mother's womb, you know, or having my grown babies coming back into my womb. You know, he said, Can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born you know god's word is filled with revelation it is revelation you cannot just look at it at face value and settle for it because all jesus christ came to reveal to us was revelation he is the personification of god revealed in flesh he is the revelation you know god the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons in one God exist in heaven. But Jesus Christ, who is the second person of the Trinity, he became the, person, the personification of God upon the face of the earth. He is revelation. He walked on this soil. He, he lived like a man. He brought the mystery of God into light. He revealed who God is. So when Revelation himself is walking upon the earth in bodily form, and he says to you that he is the word, he reveals it. He reveals the word. He reveals who God is. He reveals who you are, because when the Trinity sat together in Genesis 1, they said, let us make man in our own image. And scripture says, in their image, they made him. In God's image, he made you. And so to redeem humanity, God the Son chose to come upon the earth to redeem the position we lost in Eden when Adam gave over his identity and his authority by yielding to the enemy, by yielding to the voice of the serpent, because whatever voice we listen to is a voice that has a covering over us. So if we listen to the voice of the father and obey his word, then God's covering is over us. We have the identity of the father. And so when we listen to the voice of the enemy, we take on the identity of the enemy. And Adam sold his birthright over to the serpent when he chose to partake of the fruit that he was presented with. God told him, if you eat that, you will die. You will surely die. And Satan came and presented another truth to him which was actually a lie, you know, because he said that if you eat this, you will be just like God and God doesn't want you to be in his image. It, that was already a lie because God had already made Adam in his image. And so Jesus Christ here comes into the scene to restore us into a, a new life in God. Restore all that we lost in the garden. Restore who we were from the very beginning. Show us the pathway 
into a life of what it means to walk on this earth as a living being, as a son of God. And so this is where this whole conversation with Nicodemus becomes so interesting because Nicodemus is um, a very highly esteemed um, Pharisee. In that day, he was a teacher of the law and religious issues. He was well-learned. He knew the the details of what it meant to be a, a religious person, what it meant to be a Jew, what it meant to it meant to worship God. So for him to come to the Lord in the middle of the night, he was searching for, he was searching much deeper within for Jesus Christ. And then Jesus is talking to him, a man of such high, high ranking, you know, you know, in this present day, we'll say he has gone through so many um, theology schools and he's well known in society for being so Leonard in that field. He's an authority. And he's telling Jesus, when Jesus says that you have to be born again, he's like, can this grown man go back into his mother's womb? So if this man could think in those terms, there's so many other areas that you and I think in these terms. And so I like this passage because it draws us deeper into who Jesus is and how he speaks and what he means when he speaks. So we move on there to verse 5. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He has to be born with water. You're born in your mother's womb, you're filled, you're sitting inside a womb of water. The first time I had my baby, um, actually, before I had my baby, I was I had to jump up from the bed like, thank God we didn't have a rug in that room. Like a bucket full of water was just pouring out. I'm like, what is this? It just kept pouring and pouring like so much water. You know, so you're born of water, you're a human being upon this earth, and then you have to be born of the spirit. You cannot enter into the kingdom of the Lord if you are not born of water and the spirit. And the Lord Jesus changed the whole dynamics of being born of water. And we we will have other teachings on what it means. We will know better in the baptism and how it all started, we will go into Noah, we will go into um, how um, they were baptized in, 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 in the ark, we will go into John the Baptist coming to set a new standard, setting a pathway where we are buried and we rise up with Jesus. So watch out for that teaching, it's going to come up very soon, um, because I, I don't want us to miss any of these revelations that Jesus Christ um, was talking about. Then he said that that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. So there's a born of water is flesh, and born of spirit is spirit. You must be born again. The wind blows where, where it wishes. The wind blows where it wishes. The wind blows. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone born of the spirit. So this born again experience is a life where you are like the wind. You are like the wind. You blow. Or maybe you are the wind. <laughs> You are the wind. You blow. You blow wherever you please in the spirit. When you become a son that is giving over, that has given over your life to Jesus Christ, you are like the wind. You go in the spirit. You move in and out. You go in. You go where you wish in the spirit. You go by the spirit. No one can tell 
No one can tell where you come from or where you're going into. Hallelujah. You go to and fro. He said, my sheep hear my voice. They will not listen to the voice of a stranger. You listen after the voice of the Lord. Your voice is after the voice of the Lord. You become his voice. You carry his sound. And the enemy cannot even understand where you're coming from or where you're going to. But when you stand in the authority, in the name of Jesus, he will flee. They know your authority. They know who you represent. Like when the sons of Scammer were like saying, oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches about, uh, 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 preaches about, the demons came upon them, trampled upon them and said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? So your voice, your voice as a spirit, when you begin to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, your voice as a spirit being, is powerful in that kingdom and they recognize you. They knew Jesus. They knew Paul. He carried a sound because he moved by the spirit. And so your sound is heard. Your sound, your, your sound is heard upon the earth. Your sound is heard in the entire spirit realm. But they can't see you go into the kingdom and take up that treasure. They can't see you bring it out. They can't tell where you go, how you move. You move like the wind. <laughs> and we have so many revelations about the wind every time the spirit of God the spirit of God who we are likened unto another person of the trinity that we are in likeness to he always comes at the wind we see all through the old testament we look at Elijah Elijah when he was carried into heaven it was a whirlwind that took him into heaven and then we look at Ezekiel 1 in that whole supernatural encounter, we see a, we see while we come into the scene, we see um, even at Pentecost, Jesus Christ said that He was going to give us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would teach us all things. Those things that He taught, the Holy Spirit would bring them all to our memory. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us the things for us that were in physically present at the time of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is bringing all of that into our remembrance right now. And he comes like a wind that were gathered in the high, in the upper room and the Holy Spirit like a rushing wind. Like a rushing wind. Jesus breathe with me. Lord have your way. Lord have your way in me. Scripture says that the father breathed breath into Adam and Adam became a living being. That is a rock, the breath, the wind of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what it means for you to be born again and be a spirit being operating upon the earth. Operating in the kingdom of your father. This is what it means to be born again. And, I, and in, in verse in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? You may be there and your heart is wondering, what is she talking about? It is okay because revelation breaks you out of the limited sphere of the natural realm and it takes you into the reality of who you were before the foundations of the earth. Who you were in God as a spirit being before you came to the earth. Who you existed. Your form, your true nature. You are spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body. This is your body. But your spirit is within. Your spirit has the free access to move in and out of God's kingdom like the wind. And the gates of hands will not prevail over you. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you. He expected that a teacher of Israel, you know, a man of such high standing and so learned should know these things. So he, he's like, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen. So he just, he wasn't just talking about something he read about or studied about. 
this life you're called to as a born again child of God, it's not just reading and having the mental understanding or trying to figure out in the realm of knowledge. It's an experience with the Father. You talk about the things you know, the things you've seen, the things you've engaged with the Father. You've got to see it, to know it, to pray it, to bring it here upon the earth. You've got to behold the Father to understand that you are loved. And he calls you in. He said, my sheep, they come in. I am the door. They come in. They find pasture and they go out. They come in, they find pasture, and they go out. He said, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you did not receive our witness. I'm telling you, even today, there are sons of God who are stepping in and out of that realm and beholding the face of the Father and having encounters with the Lord and making it a lifestyle of worshiping Him, of living His truth. And when we tell the stories, sometimes it's hard to believe, but this is what it means to be a son of God. This is what it means to be born again. It is about seeing and testifying of the truth that you encounter in your walk with the Lord as the wind. As the wind you have come. I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. So this was still just earthly stuff Jesus is saying. And they're talking about wind and things like that are things that we're used to seeing in the earthly realm. And even this explanation is like, I've told you earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe it when I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven. So you have to think about it here right now. I want you to think about what Jesus is saying. Engage revelation. He's trying to bring Nicodemus out of his box into the reality of what he, Jesus Christ, has seen and witnessed. And he's telling him, you say, no one has ascended into heaven. Really? You know, I ask you, I'm like, is it true that no one has ascended into heaven? And this is why we say always in the, pre the revelation of the word, Jesus Christ himself. In the pre his words as revelation. Oh, because of course we know that uh, many people have ascended. We know the story of um, Enoch that walked with God and was not. Because God had taken him, he didn't have to go through natural death. We know about Elijah, which we spoke about earlier on, and how he was translated into heaven by a wild wind. We know about the case with a rich man and Lazarus where Lazarus was sitting in the arms of Abraham and the rich man was looking into that kingdom and asking that Lazarus be released upon the earth and speak the good news to his loved ones so that maybe if somebody came from the dead and spoke to his loved ones, then they would turn around. So we know people have been ascending. So many references. But he said, no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. Jesus Christ is the one who came down from heaven. And we also know that he came through natural birth. He came through the womb of a woman by the water, by the flesh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We know that scripture says to Jeremiah, before you were born in your mother's womb, I knew you. I called you a prophet. We know that. We know that as spirit beings, we existed with the Father and we came with our destiny scroll to the earth. We made a decision to come upon the earth and glorify the Lord here on the earth and leave out the destiny scroll he wrote concerning us. Just like Jesus, he said, to fulfill your will, I have come. I 
as it is written concerning me the volume of the books. So that is also a portion. But here is the interesting part. He says, No one has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven. That is, the son of man who is in heaven. So now he's talking about himself because he says the son of man who is in heaven. He's talking about the special son of man who is presently in heaven. It wasn't just about anybody else at this time. He's giving us a blueprint of how being born again is but in this specific verse where he's referring to himself, he says the son of man is in heaven. Wait, here he was on the earth face to face with Nicodemus, talking to him, and then the next minute he's talking about himself being in heaven. He said, is, is is a present tense. Jesus Christ was on the earth talking to a man and telling him about being born again and being a man of the spirit that with his flesh is flesh, that with his spirit is spirit, giving him all this truth. And then he says that he is in heaven. I'm sure Nicodemus Brown will be like, wait, what are you saying? You're here with me. What are you saying? You're in heaven. This is the duality of our existence. That we can be present upon the earth and be present with God. That is why Jesus would say, I do not do a thing without first seeing my father do it. In John 5, verse 19 to 20, but Jesus said, I tell you the truth. The son does only what he sees the father doing because the son does whatever the father does. The father loves the son and shows the son all things. Amen. And he said that the father will even so show the son even greater things. So it's Jesus Christ could only do the things he sees his father do, how much more you and I. We got to see what our father is doing in order to do that. Because God placed us on this earth to be a, rep a representation of who he is so that the way he reigns in heaven and rules in heaven, he wants us to rule and reign here on earth in the same fashion. This is his plan for you and I. He gave us dominion from the very start. He said we should take absolute dominion upon the earth. And then there's a marvelous prayer that all Christians agree on. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is you and I coming into agreement that what we see taking place in heaven, what we see the reality of that kingdom revealed, should be manifest here on earth as well. Amen. So you may be like, Nadia, what is the spirit being? What is this whole body and this whole thing you're saying? Okay, you are a spirit being. You're a three-part being. You are a spirit, soul, and body. So you are made in that image, that spirit image with God. And then your soul is an interface between your body. Your body is a flesh. It's just a combination of the chromosomes from your father and your mother giving you all the external features. Your soul is the interface that causes you to interact with your spirit and your physical body on the earth. The soul is the seat of your emotions your reasoning, your will, all of that comprises your soul. And in most cases, we allow our soul to lead the way, but the Lord designed that our spirit will have the superior advantage over the other two parts of our being. So it's always supposed to be spirit first, 
and then the soul comes under the authority of your spirit, and then the body just does what the soul says to do. But most of the time when one is not walking with the Lord, or even when you're walking with the Lord, you have so much struggle with your soul. And that's why the intent is to break free from the soul. I'll do further teachings on this, but I just want you to just understand um, that, for example, I had to go pray for someone this week and I wasn't quite prepared. You know, we're in this pandemic, so we just go out some days. So the soul now is telling me, you know what, Nadia, you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to, you know, okay, make it another day. And yet, you know, even had had this amazing dream that I knew I had to go release in that place. And the Lord was like, go do it. And so I struggled with, you know, I have to take this child here and all of that. And then I was like, you know what? I can drop that child off and I can cover up all the stuff that, you know, <laughs> that I don't want anybody to see. And I can just go there and do what the father wants. So my spirit had to rise above my soul the decisions of the soul, where I'm reasoning out everything, where I'm thinking out everything, all the things that oppose the spirit. That's where the soul comes to play. We analyze and all of those things that inhibit us. That's why faith operates within the spirit realm. So I was able to now take my body, right? Once the soul came under the leadership of the spirit, my body could go there and pray over the person. But if I had allowed my soul that superior advantage, then my spirit definitely would be secondary to the soul. And then my flesh will stay where it is and stay in that bubble of lies, that bubble of limitation, you know. So just to place leadership where it belongs as the Godhead designed it to be. Amen.